and good morning everyone and welcome to this um, installment of our practical people management series. Um, I'm Ed Hussey, the head of our people solutions team here at Menzies, uh, providing HR services. Um, Karen and Chris are here from, from the team this morning. Um, Karen's, Karen's going to be uh, um, participating in the discussion. Chris is um, making sure that, our, that technically we're all good <laughs> um, and uh, handling any questions. And we're really pleased to be joined this morning by Ashley Holden, who's an employment solicitor from GBH Law, who we collaborate with on, uh, on various matters, including settlement agreements so uh, we thought it'd be good to to provide a perspective from a from an HR and from a legal um, angle this morning. So um, please put questions in the chat. We'll be very happy to deal with any questions that you've got. So please uh, pop them in, and Chris will keep an eye on them, and then we'll make sure we deal with those during the course of the discussion. Um, and. Um, don't forget that the whole series of practical people management sessions is available in the employers community. This one's going to be added to it as well. And for all of those of you attending, we'll remind you about that in a follow up email that we send um, a little bit after the session when we can make the recording available and point you to other um, to other webinars that we've uh, that we've got there. Okay, so let's make a start. Using a settlement agreement is quite a common way of bringing someone's employment to an end. Um, so we thought in this episode, uh, we would look at when you use a settlement agreement and why, what they contain, uh, what to consider, um, including how you bring up the subject with someone that you were in a situation where you'd like to use a settlement agreement. Um, and, and the tax status of payments. So we're going to have a good chat through all of the various angles. Um, the main reason we as HR advisors get involved in negotiating settlement agreements is where our client is either facing an actual or potential employment claim where their commercial judgment is that it will be better to seek to settle it rather than defend it or where they're looking to agree an exit with an employee in circumstances where they alternatively might be looking at a disciplinary process, a performance management process, an absence management process, which of course can become protracted, expensive and time consuming. So they obviously, they, they often look to sh short circuit that process by trying to reach settlement. So actually, those are our uh, main experiences, but are there other kind of use cases for for using a settlement agreement that you that you come across? Yes, there are. They they tend to fall into a, a category of effectively acting as an insurance policy, and um, by which I mean that um, when there are certain types of dismissal being undertaken, um, the, the a settlement agreement can act as effectively a clean break um, and ensure against any claims being issued. Typically they're used in this situation where the claims or the, the process might be more time consuming or difficult to follow. So for example, uh, an employee who's in Ill, uh, you know, in poor health and uh, someone that's not performing um, instead of going through a full process with them, uh, it could be redundancy or restructuring. Um, it could be a situation where um, age discrimination could be an issue. Someone that's in, still in the workplace in their you know, late 60s or something, but slowing down and they want to have a conversation and see if they can bring the um, arrangement to an end instead of having to maybe manage out someone who's worked for the business for 30 years or something, which is always more difficult. Um, and then the other is issue um, which we often see is when there's a company sale. So if there's a, um, a share sale and part of the agreement is that the current directors, for example, are going to leave on completion or shortly following once they've carried out a handover, um, then it's often um, a settlement agreement will be put in place for them 
to make sure that they can't bring any claims once they've left as well. Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of circumstances where um, a, an agreement like this can be think, thought about and uh, put in place if it's thought appropriate. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ashley. So let let's look at the follow follow up on the sort of legal position. Um, what we're effectively doing with a settlement agreement is persuading the employee to waive their statutory employment rights and protections, and in particular those that give them the right to make legal claims against the employer. But employment law prohibits employers from waiving or trying to contract people out of their statutory rights, and so a settlement agreement is only legally enforceable if certain conditions are met so it's not something we can just draw up informally and uh, and do um, it there there are some very specific elements to it that have to be in place in order to make it legally enforceable so Ashley just coming back to you can you tell us basically what those are Yes, I can. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there are basically six requirements. Most of them are pretty straightforward. Um, for example, the first of those requirements is that the agreement has to be in writing. Um, sounds obvious, but um, it's 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 something that people can overlook. Um, the second thing is a bit more troublesome, um, and that the the act states that um, a settlement agreement has to relate to a particular complaint or proceedings um, we're going to come back and talk about this in a little bit but basically if you're going to settle something there has to be something that needs settling um, so it has to relate to to some claim or potential claim um, thirdly um, fairly straightforward again because the employer so the employee is giving up their legal rights they have to go and get advice from an independent advisor that will usually be a solicitor but it doesn't have to be it could be a union rep or CAB as long as they've got the relevant accreditation but they have to go and get independent advice so that they know what they are doing and in particular um, they have to be aware as to the terms and the effect of the settlement agreement um, and how it will impinge on their ability to pursue any employment rights before an employment tribunal in the future. Um, I mean, the whole point of those is that it will stop them being able to bring um, those claims. There's a couple of examples uh, or ex exceptions to that. Um, which I'll mention later, but basically because it's stopping them being able to bring a claim, they've got to go and get advice so they fully understand what that is. Um, there's a few rules about the advisor. I said it's usually a solicitor. That's because they've got to have some insurance or indemnity that will be provided to the employer should that advice be given um, negligently and they suffer any loss. Um, and because, again, the advisor is, is an important part of this process, the agreement itself has to set out who that advisor is. So it's got to be very clear on the face of the document that all these things have happened. And finally, there are a number of conditions, um, as I said, relating to settlement agreements. And the agreement simply has to say that the intention is that all those agreements have been met. Um, so there's just those six that are um, really key elements. Um, if any of them don't exist, um, then it's still an agreement between the parties and can be enforceable as an agreement, but it won't be a, a settlement agreement in its legal terms, so it won't waive rights. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ashley. And just coming back to the point about um, uh, disputes needing to exist there was there was a change in 2013 wasn't there where um, which basically allowed um, settlement agreements to be used in anticipation of a dispute um, rather than further down the further into the process where a dispute actually exists is that right that's correct yes so uh, yeah. Whilst the settlement agreement has to relate to a particular complaint, as I say, it doesn't mean that, that a claim has to have been issued before a tribunal or even threatened. It can be a potential claim that's raised 
um, and discuss, maybe discussed with the employer, or it can be an employer that's decided that if he goes down the route of that he's planning, it would potentially lead to, say, an unfair dismissal claim, but he'd rather abridge the process and um, settle it with that. So there'd be a potential claim there. Um, the other thing that um, is important just to understand is that if you enter into a settlement agreement, it also settles all future claims um, and any claims that you don't even know about as an employee. So uh, it's, it is all encompassing now. Great. And I know from an HR perspective, that, that sort of change um, was very helpful because it meant that people could have much earlier conversations with someone um, about the option, about the issues that exist um, and then the potential solutions to them, one of them being a, being a settlement agreement. So, Sorry, I was just going to say that's right, because before the change, if you started to have that conversation, it could potentially amount to a constructive dismissal in itself. And it took away right. that risk. Right, great. And that's, and that's a good link to the next part, because actually opening that conversation that, 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 that can now be protected is something that we often get involved in as HR advisors on how people open that up uh, with an employee. So where you're facing a problem with one or more employees relating perhaps to performance or disciplinary redundancy issue, as Ashley has mentioned, but there isn't yet a complaint or a, or a dispute um, and maybe no, maybe no formal uh, process yet in place to manage their redundancy or, or, or performance problem. You're able to use what's called a protected conversation. Um, and this was what was introduced in 2013 um, to float the idea of a settlement with the employee without them, as Ashley says, being able to use that conversation against you later. So, Karen, let me bring you in here and, um, you know, to, to tell us more about uh, protected conversations as someone who's, you know, been involved in one or two. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that I think that's right, Ed. And just to say that that very often is the our initial contact with the client will be to say, I, I think this is the direction that things are going and I want to have this conversation. Um, so a protected conversation offers similar protection um, to without prejudice, which people might have heard of. Um, but unlike, unlike the without prejudice principle, um, protected conversations can happen earlier. So they can happen when there's no existing dispute. Um, and that can sometimes appear to be out of the blue to the employee. But of course, the employer will know more about the future and what's what's coming. Um, and essentially then can preempt that potentially with a protected conversation. Um, they can be uh, proposed by employees. Um, I've, I've actually never experienced that. So it's usually the employer approaching the employee um, and they allow the employer to hold the conversation with the employee where they propose a settlement agreement um, and say to the employee that they will offer them a sum of money um, usually to leave their job, not always, we'll talk about that later, but it's usually to end their employment. Um, and because of the settlement, the employee won't be able to bring a claim against the employer. Um, those conversations may not be successful, but if they're not, and the protected conversation doesn't achieve its outcome, the employee can't then, as Ashley mentioned earlier, use the fact that the employer raised it with them um, as part of a claim. Um, so if they do later end up in a dispute, they can't use that protected conversation to, um, for instance, resign and say, say it was constructive dismissal. Um, it's important to say that um, you can't use the protection um, if you're acting in a, in a discriminatory way or if you're not paying the appropriate wages, for instance. Um, this protection applies to potential unfair dismissal claims where you're going to have a process and a procedure um, and potentially end the person's employment. So that's the primary purpose of them. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the conversation, but just to sort of say you, you can't frame this conversation in any inappropriate way. So while it's protected, 
and you can be relatively cards on the table about the discussion that you have. Um, you can't conduct that conversation um, uh, and base it around anything discriminatory. Uh, your behaviour as the employer can't constitute anything to do with bullying or be unreasonable in any way. You have to give the employee time to consider and to be seen to act reasonably. Um, and although, say, for instance, the conversation may say that the employee is facing a performance or a disciplinary process and the conversation is to preempt that, um, you can't use that as a threat. So you can't say, if you don't accept this deal, I'm going to sack you anyway, because there's still a process to go through. If the conversation fails, so you'll, you'll need to go through the process. So you're not using that process as a threat, but you are explaining the consequences of not reaching an agreement. Um, Ashley's already mentioned it comes with legal advice, which is often paid for by the employer. It comes with a reasonable time to consider we, we often recommend that's at least 10 days. Um, and essentially we help the clients to script that conversation so that um, they can make an early start, which can be very helpful in avoiding lengthy and costly internal processes. Um, it's a delicate situation though. It needs to be handled carefully. It does indeed. And there's there's ACAS, you know, guidance around uh, around all of that, which is contains the, the kind of advice that you've just covered there, um, Karen. But I, I think often it's it's as with many difficult conversations, it's starting it that, that is the most <laughs> that is the thing that's most nerve wracking and that needs to be well, well thought out. And, it's you know, it's difficult for employers to, uh, you know, to open up this conversation, particularly in circumstances where actually their employee might not really be that aware that there's an issue or that if there is one, it's not perhaps as it felt, felt as serious as it now is going to appear. So that's always a difficult one for for employee for employers to, to tackle. So how does it normally pan out Karen how do we normally suggest people you know tackle that particular challenge yeah hopefully they'll come and talk to us first yeah. so um because then we can help them plan it out um, I'm, I'm not saying sometimes we don't have the aftermath of a of a rather rushed and, and blurted out conversation that that wasn't planned and and then you're backtracking but ideally certainly the employer will know that there's an issue even if it's not on the horizon at this point for the employee. Um, it, there may be performance concerns. Um, they may have been discussed informally. They may be on the edge of, of taking a step into a formal procedure. Um, sometimes there's difficult behaviours that they haven't been able to broach yet. So there, there, will, be, there will be an issue. We, we've dealt quite a number of times with upcoming reorganisations where the plans are quite well known and, and um, the employer knows where that's heading, but the employee potentially at that point doesn't. Um, th there are some legal sort of parameters that you need to put around the conversation. So in scripting it, you can be really clear with the employee that you're entering into this conversation and, and that it falls within this protected you know, environment. Um, but you need to carefully then explain the problem. Um, how you intend to resolve it, um, what the consequences might be, um, and they may be disciplinary or performance, but say that you'd like to explore the alternative. Um, often that, you know, that's that's nicely framed if it's a, essentially a mark of respect to the employee that, that you know, you don't want to go through a protract, protracted process. You know, taking the example Ashley used earlier of a very long serving employee um, who maybe through health or, or other issues, their performance is dipping. Um, so you can frame this very sensitively if, if you need to, but tell them that you need to explore an alternative possibility. Um, they will be leaving the business, but it'll be under a settlement that both parties can discuss and that will be acceptable. You ask them if they're willing to have that conversation, because at this point you're going to put the cards on the table. Um, and you allow them time to consider that and potentially say, yes, they, they would like to have the conversation. Often they'll say, yes, I'm prepared to do that. And, and you carry on. Um, at this point, you're going to essentially be putting terms forward. Um, 
And that's why it's really great if a client will come and talk to us first, because there might be things they haven't considered. And it's much better if they've thought about this before they're in front of the employee. So settling with an employee doesn't remove any statutory entitlements. So um, if they have a six month notice period, um, that, that's going to be due to them. And that isn't going to satisfy the requirement to settle. It'll be their contractual entitlements plus. So doing your sums on what's owed, I think, is really important. Um, you, you also need to consider um, what protections you want to be part of the agreement. So this may be a highly valuable employee who could leave and go to a competitor. And for that reason, you'll have post termination in their in their contract. Now, you don't want to breach their contract because you want those post terminations to be part of the settlement. So that needs to be really carefully thought through. But let's say it's a redundancy situation. The person's going to be moving away. They're going to be starting a new role. Maybe your business doesn't even exist. Maybe the post termination restrictions won't be relevant anymore. And therefore, removing them and not enforcing them would also be part of the conversation. Um, the employee is going to have things that they want. They, they're going to want a message to go to their colleagues. They're, they're going to want to be able to explain their departure. Um, they're going to want a reference um, as positively as possible for their future employment. And all of that communication can be discussed and explored and mutually agreed. Um, so I think all of those things need to be thought about um, and the employer needs to cost very carefully what that's going to look like. There may be considerations around how they treat the notice period, um, whether they want the employee to remain on garden leave, um, and there'll be costs associated with that. So, so what benefits do they have, particularly that the employee might want to keep? So, you know, what's going to happen to private health care? Um, will that even be extended perhaps beyond the date of termination? Now, the more you can have a conversation that considers their exit and makes it appropriate for them, um, and obviously suitably compensates the fact that they are going to sign up to waiving their legal rights, you'll need to put some money on the table for that. So it's well worth thinking through what your potential costs are beforehand. Yeah, that's great, Karen. And, um, it, you know, sets out really um, clearly how important it is just to plan uh, both in terms of how you tackle the conversation so that you so that you tackle it in the right way and don't jeopardise its, its the protections, um, but also that you think about you think ahead, because actually, as soon as someone says, um, yes, I'm interested to have a conversation, you're basically into a negotiation at that point. And there's, from that point on, there's not much more to talk about other than what's on the table. So um, so having your ducks in a row on that is really, really important. And then, of course, that goes forward into the agreement itself. Um, so let's come back to that. Um, there are things, as Ashley mentioned at the beginning, there are certain things it must uh, cover and it must contain. And then there are things that you might want to agree for additional protection. Um, so the basics, the basics of it are that the agreement's going to um, ex explain who the parties are, what the circumstances are, and the, what the date of termination is going to be, the payments to which the employee is going to be entitled by contract. So that'll be things around notice, outstanding holidays, other contractual entitlements that they have. The ex gratia payment that Karen mentioned. So this is the sum of money that's essentially going to buy you the buy you the settlement because everything else they're going to have an entitlement to anyway. So this is the additional sum that's going to uh, persuade them to, you know, to agree. Um, then the fact that this is that this is a settlement agreement and that it uh, uh, and it complies with the relevant laws. Um, the it lists the potential claims that the employee may have in the circumstances and refers to the legislation that allows for them to be waived um, and it deals with the confirmation that the employee has received the independent advice that Ashley spoke about and there's a statement from that advisor that they meet the necessary criteria and they've got the insurance in place 
and then there'll normally be something around confidentiality of the agreement and uh, and things like that now i mean those are the sort of basics but there are other but you do see settlement agreements of very varying length sometimes so actually what um what other considerations do people have or do you advise them on in you know in certain circumstances that they need to include I think when I'm looking at a settlement agreement um, in general, I look at it as three parts. Um, there's the, there's the, the part of the settlement that deals with the, um, the termination and what's going to happen up to that point. So the, the things that you've just been talking about, notice and in particular how those notice periods are going to be dealt with. Are, is the employee going to work that notice? Is he going to be paid in lieu? of that notice, what's the position regarding tax and that sort of thing. So, and then the same thing with benefits, um, pension, etc. Setting out what's going to happen with all those things up until the point of termination. The second part of the agreement, I think, is probably the more operative bit, which is the waiver of claims and things um, that the, we want the agreement to achieve, uh, which is fairly standard. But then the last part is the, the part of the agreement that effectively regulates what happens after termination. So here we're talking about um, maybe uh, references. Um, is someone, um, uh, or you, you'll often have in here um, situations dealing with company property. It's not unusual that maybe the employee retains their laptop or mobile phone or whatever when they leave, um, but everything else gets returned. So that sort of thing will be there. Um, confidentiality um, and who they can discuss with um, and um, clauses dealing with that. There's, there's a, a lot of things you can't do now with these agreements. There was a lot of um, issue in the press um, a few years ago about non-disclosure agreements this part of this settlement agreement who you can talk about and or who you can talk to and what you can say um, and then we've got things that Karen mentioned restrict post-termination restrictive covenants it is if if they exist in the contract of employment then you will want to set out in this settlement agreement that maybe they will continue um, on the same terms or if they don't exist or you want to update or amend them it's an opportunity to now add new um, covenants in there um, and as uh, as Karen also re mentioned, things like references and um, notifications to it, both internally and externally as to what's going to be said can all be factored into the agreement in this this third part. So I think you've got to look at it um, and, and, and as has been said earlier, get your ducks in a row before the conversation and think about the, the in particular the arrangements up to termination and then secondly what you want to happen post termination just to make sure everything is clear and if you're trying to um, persuade or convince an employee that they should enter into agreements then this is quite important um, the reference and um, whether there are going to be restrictions and things like that are important to the employee perhaps not as important as how much they're going to get paid as an ex gratia payment, but they can still be things which will convince or encourage an employee to enter into an agreement. So need to be thought out um, carefully. Thanks, Ashley. Um, let's talk about uh, tax data. We talk about different types of payment that are going to be covered in the agreement. And let's just talk about tax status because there was a time uh, when things like non-contractual notice pay could be included as part of the tax-free allowance. But of course, in, as is the way of things, HMRC gradually close all these uh, loopholes and, and tighten everything up. Um, so these days, um, any entitlement to notice, um, no matter what it says in the contract about whether, whether it can be paid for or it has to be worked, it doesn't matter. Anything that's all, all notice um, entitlements, 
are taxable. So any payment in lieu of any type of notice are now subject to tax. Um, um, and so they, that needs to be honoured and it needs to be very clearly set out for the avoidance of doubt, as Ashley mentioned in the in the agreement, how notice is being dealt with so that you don't get. Um, and, that, and that obviously has to reflect reality um, so that you don't get potentially caught out later. Uh, in fact, any payment that relates to work undertaken or recognition for work done, um, apart from any outstanding holidays, should all be taxed. So it's very, so the termination payment, as we call it, the ex gratia bit, um, the bit that you're paying on top of those um, contractual entitlements in order to secure that agreement is, you know, has to be carefully considered for, for what you're compensating um, so that it doesn't get caught um, as, as taxable. And essentially it's a, it's a compensation for loss of office type of, type of payment. And one thing that you often see in the, or you normally see in the agreement is, um, and it is an indemnity actually, that the, uh, where the employer asks the employee to indemnify them for any future tax liabilities that might arise. And I don't know what the, uh, Ashley and Karen's experience is, sometimes that gets picked up by the solicitor on the other side who's advising the employee about where that you know where that indemnity should sit but normally the employer will try to achieve, uh, obtain an indemnity so that any any future questions that hmrc asks the employee about the tax status of their termination payments is is the employee's issue um so in terms of, Ashley, are there other considerations when it comes to uh, structuring payments? And what happens, for example, where you want to um, include something like a post-termination restriction that wasn't previously there in their contract? Because there, is, there, are, there are situations where there has to be some consideration for that, aren't there? There are, yes. Um, you have to look at that carefully. It becomes a... Um, a payment relating to the employment and it's taxable. So normally if you're going to do that, because of the rules um, about consideration and they don't need to be sufficient and all that sort of thing, you would normally just have a nominal, say a hundred pounds uh, as, as, as a, an incentive or a payment for entering into the covenants. Um, and then if you've got uh, any spare um, ex gratia limit, I mean, you know, within your 30,000, and if the if you were going to pay a bit extra, put it within there. Um, but generally speaking, yes, you're right. The, e the easiest way to think about it is everything is taxable unless it is purely a effective gift for entering into the agreement. If it's not that payment over and above any entitlement, then um, the easiest way to think of it is, is, is work on the basis that it's going to be taxable. And uh, if you're unsure, um, speak to an accountant would be my view, because the rules are very complicated. <laughs> Indeed. And our, our employment tax specialist couldn't be here today, but um, he would have uh, he would have plenty to say. And I think one of the things he would have something to say about is if you mentioned, actually, like if you were going to gift your employee, your employee their laptop, um something like that actually that is also a taxable yeah that you know that also needs to there also needs to be consideration for that because that also the value of that would also be considered as as taxable so mm -hmm. little things like that you know also need to be um thought about yeah, uh, yeah i'll just i'll just quickly do a mention on that front because i said i would seeing as um seeing as Andy Brooks isn't here and I know he likes to talk about <laughs> these things. So um, I, I think the things that um, Andy would say if he was here is you are settling for a reason. You are settling to protect the business from a potential claim. Um, you, so therefore, as, as Ashley said earlier, that there needs to have been the potential for a claim. Um, so you're not paying somebody some money because they've done a really decent job for the last 25 years or because they're a thoroughly decent person or because of the contribution that they've made in the past. Um, and you're not suddenly deciding that, you know, the bonus that they might have got 
will now suddenly become part of the settlement, so it's tax free. Anything that they they are owed for work done, you can pay them as much as you like, and you can thank them for their service and wish them well down the road as much as you like. But that will have to be taxed. Um, so I think I think that's the thing. Andy would always say, be very clear why you are settling. Don't have a resignation from the employee or a retirement that, that was up and coming and very well documented and they are stepping away perfectly amicably and then suddenly you're settling and paying them an, a, a lot of money when, when there was no claim to settle. So that that would be his, his um, line, I, I think. I think you've done him justice, Karen. Good. I'm sure. I'm sure he'll. Let, I'm sure he'll let us know when he comes That's back and has a look at what yeah. we've done. What we've yeah. done in his absence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I had another question about the timing of agreements because I know we've done we've done one or two where there is um, that. Some, an employer wants to make an agreement now about a termination that's actually going to happen sometime in the future um and so there there is a there are some issues there aren't there that need to be considered there are um and firstly whilst we're talking about tax um that's one of the issues if you are giving let's say thirty thousand pounds tax free as an ex gratia payment and you agree to do that in january um but the employment termination date is I don't know, 1st of September, nine months later, it's difficult to argue that that is an ex gratia payment rather than a payment for the work that they're going to be doing over the next nine months. Mm. And certainly the revenue are likely to challenge it. And it mm. could well be found to be a taxable despite your intentions mm. being that it's ex gratia. Mm. Um, the other issue is that you are settling all these claims um, and of course, you want to make sure that as an employer, you're catching everything. Um, so if there is a large gap between the, the agreement being signed and the termination date, all sorts of things may have happened in that period, um, which won't necessarily be covered by that agreement. So what you want to do in that situation is think very carefully about whether you should have the agreement what we call reaffirmed so that effectively you enter into the agreement in January but if the employment is going to end in September you make it a condition of that agreement that the employee reaffirms the agreement within say seven days of the termination date and imp importantly that also means that the employee's advisor has to reaffirm the advice given relating to the um, waiver of rights on, on in the settlement agreement. Um, so you do need to think about that where there is a gap between the agreement and termination of more than a few weeks. There's no golden rule. Um, you don't have to do it, but obviously the longer the gap, the, the more risk there is. Yes, thank you. And I remember one actually where we uh, where an employer was saying to someone we think in a year's time or in 18 months time you're going to be redundant and that caused a lot of issues around okay well how how that doesn't really work in terms of you know redundancy is something that either happens now or or not <laughs> you know it's kind of it's a much more immediate yeah. question. so the whole thing the whole thing about you know the tax you know the, the tax question around that again was very you know well, I was going to say complicated. Actually, it was quite clear. You know, you, you you're not going to get away with, um, you know, tax free payments in an agreement that's done eighteen months before it actually happens. Um, as as you were saying, so uh, I had I, I had a case once with a a, um, a very high paid um, a, a CEO of a, of a business um, who was effectively retiring but um, his employment was terminated early um, and he was going to be receiving, um, let's call it perks from the business. Um, he got a lot of travel and things like that. And that was gonna continue travel and hotels and things like that after he 
he had uh, he had effectively left. Oh, and in that oh. situation, we actually went to the revenue and got clearance on the agreement first. Oh. So you can do that if it's a complicated oh. issue, as, I, as obviously you will know. But uh, you do have to think about these things carefully where there is going to be ongoing um, payments or if there is going to yeah. be a long period of time between the two. And in fact, you mentioned retirement there. And I know, again, if Andy was here, he'd be saying anything that's anything that's coincident with retirement. I mean, if you were thinking of doing a set settlement agreement that said, you know, um, that mentioned they're off, that, 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 that this co that they're retiring and here's a, you know, here's a payment to go with it. That from a tax perspective, that is also uh, a no, no. So um the only way we we did it in that case was we, we we actually got large lump sums paid into the pension direct yeah exactly so those are so it's those kind of solutions that are the ones that need to be thought about and that and that's why you know kind of back to the point about pre-planning these things uh you know because once things are written down and confirmed it's you know it becomes difficult to unwind them um later if you're going to be in a potentially delicate situation with hmrc so pre-planning is um clearly important i mean the one I, i'm thinking of took about six months for us to negotiate with accountants on both sides and and with the click and the clearance from the revenue yeah yeah wow yeah. I mean, they're unusual they're they're, they're not yeah. the normal <laughs> Okay. Um, now, the last last question I had for you, Ashley, was that um, it's um, you always see a contribution from the employer to the employee for their for their legal fees. I mean, actually, it's not paid to the employee, is it? It's normally invoiced by the advisor, but the company pays at least a contribution towards the employee's legal fees. Is that a requirement within a settlement agreement? Interesting question. Legally, um, under the Act, it's not one of those six requirements that I, I mentioned earlier on. Um, and there is no legal requirement in, in any of the um, pieces of legislation dealing with these that say that such a contribution must be made. However, um, it is certainly customary, customary to pay a contribution. And if you think about it, the reason that those legal fees are being incurred under the legislation is because the employee has to go and get advice to make the agreement valid which of course is what you want so he's got yeah. to incur those costs for you to benefit from the agreement so it, mm. it makes sense for the you know for those payments to be made but they don't have to cover all the costs and usually the agreement will just refer to a contribution of 500 pounds plus VAT or whatever it might be. And as you quite rightly say, um, the invoice is usually marked as addressed to the individual concerned but payable by the employer. Yeah. Okay, good. So it's just a, one, a prag pragmatic thing that helps things along uh, when you're trying to persuade an employee that it's, uh, you know, that it's a discussion that you want to have. Okay. Good. Now, I don't think, if we have any questions into the... Um, into our chat we haven't actually Ed. there's nothing okay. uh, nothing pending at the moment it, it sounds like been, you guys well, have answered all the questions <laughs> it's been so beautifully covered that there's no, there's no questions all right <laughs> um um karen and ashley are, are there any final thoughts observations that you would have before we before we finish um, I, I wanted to go back to where I was earlier in terms of the point in the process I talked about, which is having the conversation and just ask Ashley's view really on, on the treatment of the employee once that conversation's taken place. Because my my observations are that sometimes this period can 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 go wrong and it can come back and bite the employer. So it's easier to paint with a practical example, I suppose. So you have the conversation with the employee. From that point on, you know the relationship is different and you also have to take account of how they will perform in the business from that point on. So, you know, what are they working on? Who are they dealing with? What clients are they dealing with? What information do they have that you want them either to pass over and, and all those kind of things? But they are still an employee. They're still entitled to come to work. Um, they've not done anything wrong. 
And at this point, you haven't got an agreement. So what I often see is um, offering the employee some time away. And that's usually accepted and that's usually mutual. So why don't you take a few days off to think it through, come back to me, you know, by next Friday, take this as paid holiday. But sometimes I've seen it go just a little bit further where they then say, they come back to me and they say, right, well, I've sent him home. I've taken away his laptop, his mobile phone, and I've cut off his email. Um, and um, I've, you know, I've told him he's not allowed to contact anybody. And then that's kind of tipped the other way. And the employee and their solicitor has then come back and said things like, I understand my client has now been excluded from the business and you're preventing him earning his commission. Or So I've seen it tip the other way. So that's a long way of saying, how do you get that period in the middle right? Because you haven't got an agreement yet. It is very difficult and it's a good point to raise. I think that you've got to think very carefully and look at what's happened to get to you where you are today what is it what is the reason for you wanting to have that conversation and understand that then you can look before you have the conversation to see what risks there are to the business if you have that conversation um and you you're quite right you can then say during that conversation if you think it's appropriate and, and offer the employee some time away to think about it um maybe the full 10 days so they can think about it and go and get advice and maybe they won't even come back to work if they if you've got a settlement but if they say no they don't want the conversation or if they say they do and they want to stay you can't go further than that because if you do you're giving them the opportunity to claim constructive dismissal by you taking steps as you say maybe by stopping them their, their ability to perform their work taking away their laptop cutting them off from their email excluding them from the premises all the all of these things if you forget the conversation part are things that would give them grounds to bring a claim the conversation doesn't allow you to do that all it does is allow that conversation to be without prejudice effectively um, so if you take any action like that um, uh, unilaterally without their agreement to doing it then you are potentially laying yourself open for the very claim you are trying to avoid by having that conversation you would have to in that situation if you if if they refuse to stay away from work or um or or, 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 or you know you were concerned that while they were working there could be an issue you just have to keep an eye on them obviously if they then take some steps um then you can act so if they do something untoward that starts damaging your business then you can take steps to exclude them subject to disciplinary you know suspend them or whatever for that particular step that they've taken whatever it might be but as a result of the conversation all you can really do is have a is, is is agree with them a period of time that they will um, stay away from work while they consider the agreement mm. apart from that i would caution against taking any further action um, certainly without getting advice first but this mm. is something you know i i was going to say when ed mentioned just before you said i think the the key here whenever you're having a protected conversation is to think about the whole situation all the way through um, my experience is that if you do that it tends to go quite well and the only maybe issue is that you get an acceptance sooner rather than later that the employment is likely to come to an end the the question then isn't that it then becomes negotiating on what the terms are how much the ex payment payments going to be or whatever um, it's the it's the ones that happen without the planning, the sudden ones, you know, the conversation um, that's a bit of a shouting match in the corridor. They're the ones that lead to the problems uh, where it's not been thought through in advance. So if there's one moral here to the story, it's think it, you know, think it through and, and if appropriate, get advice before you take any steps and 
and, and so you've got your ducks in a row before you have the conversation and know what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a great question and, uh, you know, and a really good point to sort of conclude with, really. I mean, I know I know that in terms of that pre-planning of how something's going to be uh, addressed, you might, for example, make a decision to start a formal process before you then introduce the idea of a settlement agreement because you need to make it clear to the employee that there is something serious here that is going on. So a disciplinary process or a performance process might be necessary to start that process and then have a settlement discussion in the context of that process having started rather than doing it in advance. And it's those kind of they're sort of tactical questions really that um, need to be addressed in mm -hmm. advance. So, um, so that message about pre-planning, I think, is a good one to uh, to leave everyone with. Um, so, thank you very much, um, Karen and Ashley, for all of your useful information. Um, just to remind everyone, we will drop you an email when the recording's ready, and we will also remind you about um, the community, uh, the employers community, which is free to join. It's got loads of great information on it you'd be very if you're not currently a member of it please do join and we will keep you updated with with useful and practical things around people management we will also tell you about future events and the next two events that we've got coming up uh, the first one is actually next tuesday the 20th of september where we're partnering up with um, lisa carver of carver coaching and we're looking at employee retention um, and the fact that what most employees really value um, and keep them close to their organizations is a sense of belonging so question how do we create that sense of belonging and what kind of what kind of management action can foster it so that's going to be a really interesting one we're doing that on tuesday the 20th and then the next practical people management session on the 13th of october is about developing talent in your business. So we'll be sending out information about that one for the 13th. But for now, uh, thanks again to our panel. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Do get in touch if you've got any follow-up questions. We'll give you Ashley and our contact details in the follow-up email. Please do get in touch with anything that, uh, that, that you want to talk about. And hopefully we'll see you next time. All right, have a thanks, good day. Everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.